All right. Hey guys, let's get started. Welcome back. I hope you had a good weekend. Um, I will be with you today and on Wednesday. And um, I understand that you have a, I won't be here on Friday. You have a test on Monday, next week. Right? Yeah. What time? Regular time? Oh, it's in the evening. I see. At 6 o'clock. Okay. All right. So the material today and Wednesday will be on your test, but not the material on Monday. <clears throat> okay. So I want to start with a brief review to remind us about some of the mathematical ideas that we talked about last week. We've been talking about making movements towards stimuli that have some reward associated with them. And we talked about how that movement is made with greater vigor. We came up with the utility that described, you know, the goodness of the movement. And then we talked about reaction time as a period when your brain evaluates different kinds of actions that are possible and decides on a winner. And then you make a movement toward it. So today I want to begin the process of looking at the brain and how does it actually do some of the stuff that we've been talking about. So we're going to begin with reaction time and we're going to focus on that movement that we've been talking about, saccades, simple eye movements from one place to another. So let's start with a brief review to talk about what some of the items were that we described. Great. Thank you for your quiet. Okay. So this is a reaction time. On the upper part of it here, what we have is a fixation point. So you're looking at a dot on the screen. And when you see the fixation point, that says as a function of time, the fixation point is on. Then at some point, a target appears. The fixation point stays on. The target appears. And you make a saccade to it. And we're just simply looking at the time from when this target appears to when the saccade was made. And that's shown in this distribution here. So you see that you have some median and you have some mean. And what we realize is that this distribution is skewed. So it has this tail. And we try to understand, well, why does it have this tail? Why does it look like the way it does? And we imagined that this tail arises because there is some process of accumulating evidence for what the action is that you want to do. And that this thing is a merit for performing that action. So it rises at some constant level r. And as it accumulates, it eventually reaches threshold. And when it reaches threshold, we think you make a movement. That's the winner of that particular action. So this is the process of decision making. You evaluate the various options. You decide that this is the one over time, as I accumulate evidence for it, is going to give me the, um, the action that I want to do. When it reaches threshold, you make a movement. Now, if you look at the distribution of this thing rising fast, it rising slow. If you look at this distribution, it has a, um, a small area to the left of the mean, large area to the right of the mean, and so therefore you get a distribution that is skewed, that looks like this. So we think that this process of accumulating evidence, if it is a random variable with a normal distribution, it gives rise to the probability distribution of latency that has a skewness. And so all right, this is what our theory says. And if we were to look at two particular actions, one that we think is going to give us a lot of reward, one that we think is going to give us less reward, both are going to rise, one with a high rate, one with a low rate. The thing with high reward is giving us a reaction time that is much earlier than the one that's going to give us um, low reward. So this was our theory. All right. Now today we're going to talk about the brain and how it does it. And the way I want to do it is that I want to again focus on these eye movements. I want to talk about the various regions of the brain, the colliculus, the encoding of action. And then I want to talk about Parkinson's disease and how it affects the process of making the movement and what's different in the way they evaluate these actions and the neural basis of the movement that's taking place. So we'll talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease. We'll talk a little bit about damage to the cortex, um, the uh, uh, parietal cortex, and the frontal eye field. All right, so here's our little schematic of the brain. Look at this point there. When I flash, tell me what you're going to look at. Lower 
Yeah, most people look at the face. So let's review what happened. That image was on your fovea, and this image here was on your fovea. When I flashed this, it fell on your retina, various parts of your retina. That information went to your thalamus, and another branch of the same neurons goes to this brainstem structure called the superior colliculus. From the thalamus, it goes to the visual cortex, it goes to the posterior parietal cortex, it goes to the frontal eye field, the basal ganglia, and it comes back to the superior colliculus. And our idea was that this is that very fast reptilian pathway that goes from your retina directly to your brain stem. And then this is what we've been added as um, uh, through evolution, a process by which we can evaluate what it is that we're looking at and decide where we should go to. And so the process of evaluation takes time, whereas the colliculus gets the information in less than 100 milliseconds, that's not when a movement is made. Another 100 millisecond passes, and that's what we think that the cortex is evaluating. What is it that it's on the retina? It says, ah, there's a face over there. That's the most valuable thing on the screen. I want to make a saccade to the screen. So as I mentioned to you, pay attention to when you open a web page, what it is that you look at first. You'll learn something about how your brain evaluates the visual stimuli around you. Essentially, it's an example of this task, except that you're doing it, you know, um, hundreds of times a day. All right, so it gets to the colliculus, and the colliculus has a map of space that we're going to go over, and it determines the winner. Where is it that I want to direct my gaze toward? It sends commands directly to these motor neurons, but then there's a side path to the cerebellum. Eventually, that motor commands get to the motor neurons, and then it gets to the muscle. It moves your eye to one side. That takes about 200 milliseconds from here down to the muscles of the eye. OK, any questions about this? Yeah? So, uh, if you upright faces, would the brain decide to like pick between two of them or would you just look like at the superposition of both of them and just go straight down? No, so remember that there's a, it's going to be a race process now. So something is going to rise to one side, something is going to rise to the other side, and the winner, whichever one the, gets there first, that's the only one that's going to move your eyes. Okay. Yeah, it's all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice way to determine basically how your brain evaluates things. What does it like? OK, so let's review the collicular map. So here's the fovea. You're looking at this dot here. And at time 0, we're going to have some images that appear. When the image appears, you made a saccade. So we're going to go through what happens in the colliculus. At 100 milliseconds, on your colliculus, this is the right superior colliculus, this is the left superior colliculus. So colliculus means hill. That's, that's all it is. And why is it called the hill? It's because in the brain stem, it actually is a little bump on the hill. So if one now records from neurons on this structure, here's what one sees. So when you're looking at this stimulus, there's a whole lot of activity on the place that encodes the area associated with the fovea, which is on the rostral pole on the colliculus. There's one on the right, and there's one on the left. So this vector here of visual space maps on to the right colliculus along this map. So neurons would respond to visual stimuli here, would be here. Neurons that would respond to this part of the visual space would be down here. So it's a map of the visual space. This vector here maps on to this part of the colliculus, and so forth, as you see. So in that, this way, when this upside down face appears, it is activity in this part of the colliculus, whereas the right side up face is this part of the colliculus. And what we're going to see is that while this causes activity, only one of these is going to reach threshold. And the one that reaches threshold is the one that says move your eye to this location. And so when there's activity that reaches threshold here, there's a burst of activity here, what that does is that it, pu it sends commands to the motor neurons of the eye, and that boom moves your eye over there in about 80 milliseconds duration of the movement. Okay? To conclude our story, 
So this is the rostral pole. So that same foveal area is mapped onto both locations of the um, uh, pole of the colliculus. The chair, here it is, appears here, and the patch of noise would appear there. So if by chance you made a saccade to the batch of noise, you did it because there was activity on your left superior colliculus um, about the area that I'm showing you. Okay, so it's a map of space on the colliculus. Any questions? All right. These superficial layers of the colliculus have neurons that respond to visual information on the retina because they're getting projections from the retina. The co right colliculus has a map of the left visual field. Left colliculus has a map of the right visual field. All right. But why is it that despite the fact that there's activity on the retina, there still takes 100 more milliseconds before a movement is made because the basal ganglia is inhibiting the colliculus. It's saying, keep your eye focused on what is it that you're looking at until a brain structure like the frontal eye field, like the parietal cortex, decides that actually I want to move my eye over there because over there is what's interesting. So the basal ganglia is inhibiting the colliculus. It's saying, stay, stay still. Focus on what's on the fovea. So it's washing the entire colliculus with inhibition. Don't move. All right. So now, for the eyes to move, neurons in the intermediate layers of the colliculus must fire. However, at this point, the basal ganglia is inhibiting the colliculus. So that's what the basal ganglia is doing. At some point, you're going to get removal of this inhibition at a location where you are most interested in making a movement. And you're going to get excitation at that same location because that's where the stimulus is that I'm interested in. So you're going to remove this inhibition and you're going to excite there. So it's a transition from holding to moving. So you begin to see now some of the issues associated with basal ganglia damage to the brain. So there's issues with holding you're going to get individuals that, depending on the nature of damage to the basal ganglia, they may hold too long, freeze, or hold not enough, chorea. These are the damages that come about because of things like Parkinson's disease that causes deficits that make it so that you hold and you hold and you hold and you can't move, or the opposite of it in Huntington's disease where you don't have enough inhibition and you're moving all the time. All right. So eventually, a winner is selected, an action is placed, and you make a move. So why does it take so long to start a movement? And we're going to look at this latency issue. And we're going to go through the circuit to some extent. This is the retina. It projects onto the superficial layers of the colliculus. The intermediate layers are what's needed where in order for you to make a movement, some activity has to take place here. These cells have to burst at the location where the winner is. And for that to happen, the basal ganglia has to remove its inhibition. And then the parietal cortex and the frontal eye field have to agree, that's where I want to move and activate those cells. Once they do, then there's a direct pathway to the brainstem burst generators and the oculomotor neurons, and then this indirect pathway to the cerebellum. And so, for example, one of the disorders that happens when there's damage to the cerebellum, it's not that the individual can't make a movement, they can make fine movements, except that those movements fall apart in the sense that they overshoot the movement or they undershoot the movement. It's called dysmetria. And so what you see is that this circuit, which we saw a little example of, which is central for predicting how is this movement pursuing before it ends, and can I correct it as it's taking place if there's damage here, then what happens is that the movements are made, but they're sloppy. And so you get inaccuracy in your movements, and this is called ataxia. Okay, we're going to focus on the superior colliculus today and talk about this period of decision making. Rise to threshold, burst of activity, moving your eye toward a particular location. So, why are we focusing on eye movements? It turns out that, you know, eye movements are special because the entire circuitry is in here. It's sitting here. 
in my skull from the beginning to the end of it. But if I wanted to tell you about arm movements, then I'd have to talk about the spinal cord as well. And it's a much harder place to record from the neurons and understand the physiology. So there's something special about eye movements and to some extent head movements that is accessible with electrodes that can be placed in the brain. Whereas if I want to talk about walking or if I want to talk about reaching, very important things we just don't know as much about because it's much harder to get to the structures that are involved in that entirety. Whereas for eye movements, the whole thing is here. And so in the laboratory, it's much easier to find these structures. That's one aspect. Of it. The second is that there's so much of a history from Hopkins. You know, so many of your BME professors actually work on these places. And so, you know, think about it also from a historical perspective. All right, so with activity on the colliculus. So for the, most of the data today that I'm going to come from monkeys, these animals are going to make movements with their eyes, and the recordings are made from the colliculus in a very simple way. Now I'm going to give for making these 